Thank you for staying with us. It is approximately uh, 42 minutes left in the show. Listen to Planet Creatures. Call numbers one three four seven three two six nine six two six. We should have Pete Townsend as a guest. That'd be great. Jamie, can you get to that? Yes. All right, this is what I'm going to do. We, I see we have uh, Robin Schneider. I want to get right to her. Robin Schneider, of course, the hardest working woman in um, Lansing. And um, we discussed at the break. We want to hear her comments in, in relationship to uh, the way Mr. Tirbeek described uh, Randy Richardville. Of course, there's a distinction that I want to point out, which is while there are lawyers and there are lobbyists and words are important for both, their use of them at various times are usually in different settings, and they need to remain uh, separate settings. And, of course, i defending uh, Mr. Tubik that uh, in his comments about Richard Bill, these are not things that uh, lobbyists would say. But with that kind of crazy, probably non-sequitur uh, introduction, welcome, everybody, to – welcome, Robert Schneider, to a Planet of Green Trees. Hi, everybody. I'm all of a sudden wondering what I missed. I'm going to have to – Go back and listen to the replay, I guess. <laughs> yeah, John was, uh, was uh, not too fond of uh, Richard Bill. So, uh, he, he felt he, he was a block on the current bills. And then he had very oh. little. So we, we kind of set him straight, but we had freely admit that none of us attended the fundraiser that was referenced. So uh, if you could, I know that you did. Can you give us a kind of a rundown? Yeah, I thought it was a really great event. Um, you know, one of the things I know, I've learned over the last couple of years um, is that typically when you go to speak to legislators about medical marijuana, most of them don't really know what to expect. Um, and so you need to take the time to educate them, let them know, you know, hey, I'm a medical marijuana patient and I'm, you know, a sane and intelligent person and a um, good product of society. I contribute to, you know, my community. They need to, They need to be educated first. So... We're just now coming out of that time where, you know, everybody was still, you know, thinking that people who use marijuana did nothing but lay on the couch and eat, you know, Doritos all day. So they're starting to see that, you know, we are moms and, you know, school teachers and, you know, Sunday school teachers and parents and, you know, that we're not, um, you know, uh, troublemakers necessarily. So um, it's a process. So I know that, that a lot of people still think that, you know, maybe the Republican Party is out to get us or, you know, things like that. And I've seen the opposite, but it really takes time um, working with them. Now, the fundraiser was fantastic. I had a really great time. Um, I was really happy that he was, you know, will, uh, open-minded. Um, you know, I've met with legislators who have said, get out of my office. Um, you know, I don't even want to talk to you. I mean, I, I've had that experience. And and that's not what we're seeing from Senator Richardville. We're seeing quite the opposite. Um, he seems to um, be pretty understanding about our issue. He seems to agree that we need to clarify some things in order to make sure that patients are getting um, access to, you know, he even talked about all the different forms of medication. He didn't know this a couple years ago. Um, so he's still, in, you know, he's learned quite a bit, but he's still in that learning process. And, you know, he indicated that, you know, we'll have a hearing this summer. Um, and that we can expect a final vote sometime in September. And he was very firm. I'm making a commitment to you. And I really believe he'll follow through on his word. Um, he did apologize that, you know, the Detroit bankruptcy um, did take priority to our issue, but he said we're teed up next and that we will spend time this summer working to make sure the bills are perfect um, and he will get them out of committee for us. So I, I, I thought he was very genuine um, and I, I'm – you know, I'm confident that he means what he says. In a room full of that many people, I would be, you know, I, I don't expect it to go any other way. Well, in light of the, the Carruthers decision today by the Supreme Court, can you give us any insight into what to, what potential changes might be in store for HB 5104, which is the legislative solution to the judicial problem that was just dodged today? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that, you know, I, I just want to say what a ridiculous court ruling, of course, to begin with. Um, you know, we are we all know that plant resin naturally is on the plant. It naturally falls off the plant. It's not something that, you know, it, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. There are states that only allow these non-smokable forms of marijuana. So to have a state where 
you're only allowed to have the smokable mar- marijuana. It just it makes absolutely no sense. So um, as far as, as House Bill 5104, you know, the bill was originally introduced on behalf of the pediatric community. Um, when um, the pediatric cannabis therapy group came to me and asked us to help them, um, they asked uh, NPRA for help, um, many people in the community, you know, shamed us for doing it. They said, do not um, introduce an amendment to the MLA to fix this. You need to sit back and wait for the Supreme Court to work this out. And um, so we caught a lot of criticism um, for that. But um, the parents were adamant. We are not comfortable waiting. We want to do this now. We don't trust that the Supreme Court is going to fix this for us. We've got to, we've got to get something going now because we don't have time to wait and see what the Supreme Court is going to do. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say I told you so to anybody out there, but, I, but you know, I'm glad that we move forward with this. And at this point, um, you know, in talking with the parents, one of the biggest fears, you know, this bill is singularly focused on giving them back their, um, you know, smoking alternative forms of medical marijuana um, that is the single focus of the, of the bill. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there that want amendments and they want to do this and they want to get creative. And, you know, we want to keep this bill focused on its original intent um, to make sure that, that those, you know, smoking alternative forms of medication are available, that it doesn't become a Christmas tree bill, that it doesn't become a bill to fix the whole world, you know, that's not the point of this bill. Um, so that's our goal and objective is to, is to keep it focused on what it was originally intended and get it passed through without destroying it um, in the meantime. So, um, you know, if I seem a little defensive, um, as people are, you know, suggesting we do all these crazy amendments, it's because I am. Um, <laughs> and the parents are, you know, the parents are, are really nervous and they they don't like the fact that, you know, there's people out there who really, you know, they don't, they're not sick. They don't have dying children and they're like, hey, let's do this or that. It's pretty offensive to them. And I don't blame them because this is something that is life or death um, for them. It's it's very, very serious. I talked with one of the moms today who's, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to have, I can't wait. She can't wait until September. There's no way. I mean, she's like, it'd be irresponsible for me to wait until September. My daughter could have one grand mal seizure and she could die. Um, and so parents are literally, you know, getting ready to pack up their things and leave the state and go somewhere where they can t- continue their children on their medical treatment. And it's really a shame. It didn't need to be this way. You know, I'm extremely frustrated that it's taken as long as, as it has. And I don't know what more we can do to express the urgency. I know that the legislators aren't watching these children laying on the floors having seizures like their parents are. I know that they're not seeing it firsthand, but this really is life or death. So it's just, you know, to me it's a tragedy that it's been delayed so long, um, you know, when people's lives are really at stake. Well, there's 115,000 adult patients in the state and 50, maybe 60 children patients in the state. So there's a ton of people, more than just those 60 individual patients who are going to benefit from this legislation, all of which have serious health problems and all of which definitely need this legislation. Plus all of the people, Robin, I know you know there's a ton of people out there that are just waiting for this legislation to come in before they register their their child or themselves with the uh, Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. So the delay is really really suppress some of the uh, the registrations that we would have normally seen. That's right. Absolutely. Let's What's bring the David point in registering for medical marijuana if all you can do is smoke it? All right. Um, let's bring David Rodoy in. I mean, maybe he can like, kind of uh, ask some questions without talking too much about himself. David, do you have any uh, comments on what's going on right now? <laughs> you did? Yeah. Yeah, well, first I of all, to say, I'm also here with John Targowski. Hi. Hello. The professor, the professor, and Robin, and uh, so. Hi, and there, you're the professor. <laughs> hey, Robin. Hey, Robin. How are you? Uh, not as good uh, as I could be if you were here with uh, David and I. Adam. Oh, that would be fun. You know, we've got too much work to do here. I'm glad you guys are out there having a great time, though. Well, we'll get a vacation one of these days. 
Well, so I'm, you know, I hope you're right, Robin, about uh, Senator uh, Richard Bill. He's a senator, congressman. Senator. 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 Um, oh. You felt that he was like he's not just appeasing you. When I, when I testified in front of him, when I testified in front of him, uh, I felt like he was listening. I mean, I didn't think he was blowing the thought. Uh, maybe he's just really good at that, but I, didn't, I thought he, I thought he took it credibly. I mean, he asked good questions, more or less. So, I have some confidence that hopefully he'll do the right thing here. I've never heard a stronger commitment from anybody ever. <laughs> so. Um, I, I'm I'm confident. I just the frustration on my part is that, you know, that it that it has to wait when you know we we basically ran out of time and, you know, people I've already gotten calls from people today, who you know were notified immediately that their charges are being reinstated for you know a brownie they got caught with two years ago. So I don't I don't really understand that. I don't I don't know if the prosecutors have been waiting for this ruling, but the fact that you know they're finding out they're having charges filed you know, the day of um, the Supreme Court denying the appeal is just ridiculous. What a waste of resources. I I agree. I think, like, the Supreme Court, like, just dodged it because they know the legislator's taking care of it, so they're like, well, wait, this, you know, the legislator's going to end up deciding. But it leaves a ton of people in this hole where they, mm-hmm. they're probably going to change the law and allow edibles. But because of the Carruthers decision and the Supreme Court not taking it, everybody from before this new law is getting screwed. So, kind of a rush hey, to file. Uh, Robin, you know. what, what are you guys doing or proposing that we do to sort of use the denial of the Supreme Court today to hear Carruthers, sort of to like you know create some urgency on the issue? Like, is there? I mean, yeah. Are, are, what, what's like the next step? You know, on our end, we, of course, um, you know, sent on a memo, reached out to some key people in the legislature, made sure everybody's aware, set up some meetings. Um, We sent out a a media statement um, and, you know, worked with some of the parents, of course, to, um, you know, get some statements out there as well about, you know, what they're facing um, and then asking, you know, anybody else, I mean, even if you haven't worked on this, I mean, it's everybody's got to contact their senators right now, um, their own senators, go visit their senators, go to their coffee hours, um, show up, show up, show up, um, I think is the most important thing. I mean, I feel like we've got the votes that we need. Um, it's just, you know, we've got to keep the pressure on so that we don't get put on the back burner again. And, and uh, you know, again, I don't think, that would happen, and it's really frustrating because I'm going, can they hold a special session? Is there anything they can do to speed this up? I mean, because it's summer. They're going on vacation. And, you know, again, we see the urgency, and and they're gone. That's true. There are so many people that are just held in alert because of the uh, of the delay. And, and naturally, this year, unfortunately, with the elections, uh, it's a more abbreviated legislative schedule anyway. So... Um, gentlemen out there in California who uh, proclaim yourselves as uh, members of the bar, give me your assessment now on what uh, this Supreme Court activities today mean for the Michigan cannabis community. Well, they took Hartwick and Tuttle, which, I mean, that's, it's good news because rejecting it means that the law stands as ruled on. And those are absolutely horrible decision that arguably could take away the Section 8 for everybody in the state because doctors can't prescribe dose. They can't, they don't, and it was it's a federal, federal narcotics conspiracy for them to do it, and it's also impossible because of the nature of cannabis um, to, to prescribe specific doses like that. You um, know, uh, before we got on the air, David and I were talking about out here whether or not, well, it, um, you know, what... <clears throat> Uh, we were talking about uh, what sort of, like, reasons uh, the Medical Marijuana Act in Michigan is getting so, like, just beat up by the courts, whether it's, like, uh, 
a denial of the statue really being written correctly, whether it's sort of like expectations for us, like the community, um, or whether it's, you know, sort of just an overzealous conformity by the judiciary, the judges, to, you know, kind of perpetuate the drug war. And I can tell you that I'm really surprised First of all, I mean, with Tuttle like, or with Hartwick, it really could not get much worse. So hopefully, I mean, there's really almost no downside in having that case heard. But, I mean, keep in mind that they could make, they could conceptually, they could make it worse. I mean, we have some pretty, uh, you know, unfriendly people on the Michigan screen. And they couldn't make it much worse because Hartwick effectively, if doctors are not recommending dosage, Hartwick takes away a Section 8 for all caregivers. Pretty much. Listen, I, I walked into this. Listen, listen, I walked into this. Would, would we agree that, um, that they will make a ruling that in error, Hartwick and Tuttle use the word prescription seven times in each opinion? Will we, can we make an agreement that that will be changed and, and or reversed as a principle? Could we also agree yes. that that they will never require a physician to know how much cannabis is an amount a patient should be using. Can we agree on that despite the negative trend and what I would call the you know the the uh, institutions that still hold some of the keys to our system of justice and their positions about trying to find ways to prevent people. Uh, defenses. Is that something we should look for the Supreme Court to fix? I mean, I hope they fix it, but I don't share your confidence. I think that there were parts of the McQueen decision out of the Supreme Court that I felt like were inconceivable before McQueen, you know, before they ruled on McQueen, I thought there was no way they were going to say certain things that were in McQueen. Um, so, I, just, I, disagree. I, I, you know, that's, I hope that's, you're right. That, no, no, first of all, that to a McQueen certain, was pretty obvious. Yeah, that's that, that's it was more obvious than you're leading on to. And, and and David, 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 to to rule McQueen any other way would have been a judicial ruling and an approval for dispensaries, which would have caused chaos in the state at that time potentially, and they weren't prepared. So I don't know that that that's such a fair assessment. Did you just say it would have caused chaos in the state? He did. <laughs> Even what more chaos? That's as it would have. Been. That's what we're fighting for. Hey, um, am I correct in stating that uh, People v. Jones also got accepted for a review by the Supreme Court? That's, that's the case answer. about what happens when you have contested immunity on Section 4, and it that's ruled the that the judge the fact finder on that. You guys did a show about it with Dan Grow. Of course, right. Did that's that get any, Yeah, uh, did that get, that get... I think that got uh, reviewed, right? See, you know, they that were talking about... Reviewed. Was there some references to Balsma being addressed? Is that something? No. Okay. Oh, it, they're, they're I, I think big. they're waiting. They're staying that until after this decision, and then. Practice. Balsma's. Oh, right, 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 right. What? Well, oh, what I'm saying is, you know that um, that jo- that case right now, Jones really stands for that judges get to decide whether you're immune or not, and yeah. you know if there's any hope in you know like having that type of contest, like, uh, you know, like, let's say you you think you're under 2.5 and they say you're over. Well, the judge decides you don't get to really present your side to the jury if the judge says you can't. Um, so that's pretty shitty. And hopefully as a result of some of the decisions that will happen now, that will get affected as well. Because there are cases just from our point of view that, you know, I mean, it, you almost get, like, it's crazy to have to go to trial without the ability to say that, well, I had 2.6 ounces because I had a card. I mean, because that's that sort of the state of law as it is now. So, anyway. Well, like, in the midst of this, there haven't been that many Section 8 rulings because a lot of them have been delayed because of this case. And, I mean, I know there's been some dismissals out there, um, but... I feel like a lot of these Section 8s are kind of just paused right now because we're, like, waiting to see what's going to happen. And it's going to be even more so now that uh, it got it, you know, that the Supreme Court's actually going to look at it for sure. So, uh, 
you know, I know, Mike, me and you have a couple of cases that are just in limbo. The case that I had out in St. Clair County, which has troubled me and obsessed me and uh, just a terrible, you know, you know, I showed it to you guys, a 19, 20-page opinion by um, Judge West. Judge West. Um, and I went back in there and, you know, filed a motion to stay pending Hardwick and Tuttleton. He looked me in the eye and said, there's no way, Mr. Camorn, you're going to have to accept the fact that doctors are going to be required to know how much marijuana is used. And the prosecutor said the same thing and couldn't understand how, you know, these two cases would even encompass the issues that were relevant in our case. And today she said she was big enough to send an email which said started something like, I'm, I'm you know, big enough to admit when I'm wrong or something like that. So it was nice to see that. But, but again, you know, I've titled the show, as I've titled the show, and uh, I think Mr. Tierbeck uh, echoed his feeling tonight, which is that uh, I was right, you were wrong. In other words, uh, you know, you, you know, you know the sweet, the sweet taste of that, Michael, is that uh, Judge Lieber in Circuit Court, in 17th Circuit Court in Grand Rapids, the Circuit Court judge that initially ruled against Turbig, he is. I don't want to get disbarred by the Michigan Bar, but so I'm not going to say exactly on the air what he is, but um, he, <laughs> it's, it's. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's almost worth stressing my, you know, raising my bar card to accurately describe. Uh, that person as a human being, <laughs> so I won't. But I'm just saying, like, like. I believe the term was I pinhead. Realized I almost did, and I'm like, oh, I like that Michigan bar card. So, so remember um, pin. But a, a regular civilian like Robin could probably accurately depict that person is. So anyway, um, <laughs> on that note, it's it's really sweet knowing that that's the person that you know you sort of like you you got taken to the Supreme Court and you know, reverse, like that's a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a rare feeling to have. And it's nice to have with that judge. So who's a great guy. I should, you know, that, 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 love that judge. you know, it's one of those things that the, um, he's a very pleasant a, judge, by the way, race, if so locator, the thing speaks for itself. Is that what that is? No, I don't know. I'm trying to speak Latin, but you know, look, the guy was so off in his opinion. He was so off that 10 justices, you know, who probably wouldn't agree on, you know, anything, all agreed that at a minimum, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's sometimes, not saying in this case in particular, but sometimes you just get the idea that these judges sort of reverse engineer a result and just, you know, find, you know, a- any way to justify it. Not saying it happened in this case, just saying some judges get the, you get that feeling. I mean, you know, kind of like with like, search and seizure and the cops and warrants, there's a good faith exception if the cops think they got it right, but they didn't, you know, your your uh, cocaine doesn't get, like, excluded, that kind of thing. Like, they've really made us get it 110% right in order for the immunity stuff to apply, and they hate that. So, anyway. Well, well you know, like, David made a comment later about, like, you know, whether McQueen, he never expected McQueen, but, and I didn't, I, you know, we, you know, it's, but early on, and John, you may you know agree. I know you and Dan had a lot of discussions about uh, certain you know how things were going to be uh, interpreted. But um, I mean, you uh, you know, I think at some point in time, a lot of the lawyers began to realize, independent of how you read it, independent of how you interpret it, independent of how you may discuss it with someone objectively, subjectively, standing in the shoes of a prosecutor, it could really only be read in certain ways. Yeah. But then we began to realize that in order to understand and anticipate what was going to happen with the law, we had to think sick, twisted thoughts in interpreting the law because that's where they were going to take it. I remember having a discussion, you know, having a discussion we had some meeting, and you were, I think you were there, and Dan was there, and, you know, where um, – where, you know, I've attended it, several meetings in your presence, so they kind of blend sometimes. I know, but, but – it was one where I was. I seem to remember. I seem to remember there was a little mini summit. That was in, definitely. I mean, we invoked like Article Three of that charter we signed a long time ago, which right. you know. For but anyway, um, I have to talk to you about the costume that you were wearing on that. Also, but listen, the um, what I was saying. Hey, was, for next for next week, I want to sort of run a little teaser here. David's actually out here uh, helping me on the federal case that I have going on in Grand Rapids. We have some motion deadlines. 
And I want to just say that there's some um, – in federal court in California, uh, a federal marijuana defendant has successfully gotten a judge to get a hearing to raise an equal protection argument over uh, the fact that cannabis is Schedule One and the fact that, you know, despite that it has medical value. There's an evidentiary hearing in Sacramento that's happening in August, and I'm David and I are, are putting together paperwork to try to replicate that that result in Grand Rapids. Um, so that's sort of why it's here, and that's sort of what we're we're working on. And um, I think next week, more people you'll you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But just a little teaser. Um, well, that's that's exciting. It didn't really make a lot of sense why David was coming out to California to help you work on a case in Grand Rapids. I was wondering about that. We have the motion deadline, and I just needed a gunner here, and uh, oh, I, I told them that. Uh, you they know, just wanted I, to do it on. The, they wanted to do the work on the beach. <laughs> Yeah, we're actually, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, anyway, so, uh, um, I, we right. are, it, it, there, there's some interesting things happening out here in California in federal court that we're going to try to replicate in Grand Rapids, and just stay tuned. Um, the Justice Department in D.C. has sent lawyers on this case in Sacramento from D.C. They uh, lost a motion to reconsider, and they're actually having an evidentiary hearing with Chris Conrad, uh, with a guy from from Leap, and with um, a different doctor uh, that's like a cannabis expert. And it's going to basically make prosecutors' heads explode, which, as you know, Michael, is definitely like, you know, that's like, that's like better than sex. That's you know, what we live for. The goal. That's what we live for. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, I mean, we just totally do. So anyways, on that note, I think, David and I are going to peace out. We're going to enjoy the evening, and uh, I'll talk to you more about this next week. All right? Looking forward to it. All right, and that gives us some uh, reminding time to come back to Robin and talk more politics and uh, Lansing business. So what uh, What should we – so I don't know. Is there anything else to discuss? I maybe, maybe we covered it all. You guys want to jump in here? We got some uh, legislative questions. Robin, doesn't the NPRA have a fundraiser coming up, a kind of an exciting fundraiser in Detroit you might want to talk about? Yes, um, the Detroit Medical Cannabis Guild is hosting a fundraiser for us. It's um, July 11th. Uh, it's a Friday at 7 p.m., and it's at the Detroit Historical Museum in the streets of Old Detroit Exhibit. We've got the whole exhibit for the night. Um, all the food for the event is going to be um, bought in Detroit from Detroit companies. It's a Detroit-themed, um, you know, dinner. And we have, you know, live music. We've got horns. Um, I think it's a, a Motown band or something. And um, we've got some wonderful speakers. We're at Carlton, of course. And we've got um, Fred Durhall Jr., uh, Fred Durhall III, who is running... Um, for state rep in Detroit, and I'm sure he's going to do just as great of a job as his dad did. Um, so we've got some great speakers. I think it'll be a really good time. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, you can find the event posted on the National Patients' Rights Association Facebook page or go to www.nprausa.com. What was that Detroit Medical Cannabis Guild? Can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that, too? Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a guild of um, Detroit medical cannabis businesses that are, um, you know, working to improve, um, you know, the medical marijuana industry in Detroit. Okay, great. Yeah. Any any anything else coming up? Uh, we know that the legislative mm -hmm. calendar gives you kind of a break now uh, between sessions, and you talked about doing some uh, uh, some negotiating on the nature of some of the bills. But what else is in store in the next coming months? You know, well, I think I think while the legislature is um, on break, I think the summer is a great time to, for everybody to do some local work in their cities. We've always got to remember to do that, educating our, um, you know, law enforcement, our prosecutors, our city councils, our mayors, 
Um, so I think the summer is a really good time um, to spend, you know, spreading the message that medical marijuana is medicine in uh, local municipalities because, um, you know, the change starts at home. Um, so I'm obviously encouraging everybody to, you know, do that. But I think, you know, for us, you know, we'll, of course, continue that, but we'll be making sure that, you know, the bills are in perfect condition and ready to go um, when it's time for the hearing. And I think we're, you know, really close. I think we've worked out most of the problems, but, um, you know, uh, I think there's a little more work to be done, and, and I'm looking forward to that hearing in July. What about amendments? What you mentioned some amendments that um, might be coming out. What do you think uh, those might consist of? Uh, I think that you know, like the Michigan State Police wanted to make sure that all the definitions in each bill matched up, which absolutely makes sense. Um, I think clarifying, you know, the local health department. There was something in there that you know they weren't happy with, and you know that can come out. That's fine. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think the amendments will be pretty minor. Um, you know, I think obviously the bills have been worked for over two years. It's been over two years these bills have been worked. So, I, you know, they've been through work group after work group. And I think, you know, at some point you have to recognize that, you know, a whole lot of time and effort has gone into them and, um, you know, call them as good as you're going to get. You can actually overwork bills. That's true. Well, it seems like we have neared the end of the show now. I think so, and this is a great song to end it with. I was really happy to hear the professor's voice on the line there. It just made my day. Thank you, guys. I wanted to ask them a little bit about the... uh, the footnote nine application and how they thought about that. Maybe we'll get them back on and ask them. We've got several of our attorneys weighing in from last week, including Michael. Four A and four B are just so protective on penalty. I, I can't even understand how they think they're going to zone anything without penalties. It's going on though, so we're trying to kind yeah. of expose it and. Uh, well, to get them back on and get their opinion on that, but that is an issue with the Terbeek case. Yeah, it looks like there's about 150 active uh, distribution centers in the state now, um, <clears throat> with Detroit, of course, being an active area. But uh, my people tell me that the northern Lower Peninsula, they're they're popping up like, like uh, you know, dandelions, all across the uh, the northern Lower. So. It's a, a lot of folks are, are maybe seeing the successes that some of the other places have had and are emboldened by the possibility of 4271 passing. We can only hope, since there's no statewide framework, that everybody that's establishing a new business is doing it properly and are good community partners. Yeah, I think that one thing we'll find out um, when the bills pass, I mean, a lot of people are running out and, you know, opening up, and I think they're going to find that, you know, there's, going to be rules to comply with and they're going to have to comply with state law. They're going to have to comply with local zoning ordinances and, you know, each municipality um, is going to, you know, get to have a process where they issue licenses and if you don't qualify for that license, um, you know, then, then you know, I, I don't think it's a good idea to rush out and open right now because there's a, a long way to go before the licenses, you know, go out seems like a risk to make such a big investment right now so you know every city is going to have their own you know this is how many we want this is where you want we want you to be zoned things like that so i think people that are running out and spending money to do this need to really think all of that through good advice good advice but you know i'm grateful to the people that are open because without them Patients wouldn't have anywhere to go get their medicine. They'd be meeting in parking lots and, you know, who knows where. You know, the caregivers, wonderful. But for those people that don't have caregivers, it's their only other option. You guys have a good night. Thanks a lot, Robin. Thank you, guys.
Well, it's been an exciting show so far. We normally run over. We got another half hour in us, guys. We have officially 45 minutes left in the show. We're running out of material. No, excuse me, there's uh, <laughs> six and a half minutes left. Maybe seven. Very good. So uh, I think we've covered it all. Everything is in trouble. Great, I want to see what I can cover from these folks. Good, good music. Good music from them back home. You know, the uh, High Times Cup is coming this summer in the Flint area. Here you go. Let's talk about this. In order for the court, the application for leave to appeal, the judgment of the court of appeals is considered and is granted. This is regarding Harwick and Tuttle. The party shall include among the issues to be briefed, one, whether a defendant's entitlement to immunity under Section 4 of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act is a question of law for the trial court to decide. That's what John was asking about. It's a Johnson case. Good job, Professor Hunt. Two, whether factual disputes regarding Section 4 immunity are resolved by the trial court. In other words, is it a question of fact for the jury? For a matter of law or a combination of both? As I argue now. Three, if so, whether the trial court's finding of fact becomes an established fact that cannot be appealed. Four, whether the defendant's possession of a valid registry identification card establishes any presumption for purposes of four or eight, semicolon. Five, if not, why the fuck wouldn't it? No, just kidding. If not, what is the defendant's evidentiary burden to establish? That's a good one because he has a burden going forward. Is it a burden of, whose burden is it? Is it a burden to disprove? If not, what is the defendant's evidentiary burden to establish immunity under Section 4 or an affirmative defense weight under Section 8? Hey, Becca. So you guys start with 4. 4. Whether defendant's possession of a valid registry identification card establishes any presumption for purposes of 4 or 8. If not, what is the defendant's evidentiary burden to establish immunity under Section 4 or an affirmative defense under Section 8? What about Anderson? How can they say that? What about Anderson? We already know about that. That's not an issue to be disputed. What role, if any, do the verification and confidentiality provisions in Section 6 of the Act play in establishing entitlement to immunity under Section 4 or an affirmative defense under Section 8? That's fascinating. The portion. Wow, is this going to be a wild ride? We should talk about this earlier. Why don't we read this earlier? Seven. Whether the Court of Appeals erred in characterizing a qualifying patient's physician, whether the Court of Appeals erred in characterizing a qualifying patient's physician as issuing a prescription <laughs> or prescribing marijuana. I still have a hard time believing Court of Appeals judges make those mistakes. It's 2014 for damn sake. They're not paying attention to the law or what it really means. They're paying attention to what they want it to mean. Yeah, easier to describe it as a prescription, which puts the additional burdens on it that you would have if you were qualified with the FDA. But as we know, this is an herbal medication. It's not. So the recommendation is the correct standard, and they would like to cross that line without having to actually legislate it into place. I So Hartwick and Tuttle will be heard uh, both on the same day. I will tell you that you know, the impact of this is going to be dramatic because on the issues that are of a consequence, I think, uh, I mean, it deals with the entire protection of the act. Explain, explain one issue on here that is not, if upon, if when ruled upon, isn't going to be a game changer. I can't even... Uh, I can't even begin. I liked Robin's. I'm sorry. I liked Robin's comment this evening when she mentioned that uh, uh, here we have a state that only allows smoking, essentially, with with very limited exceptions, only allows smoking, and we have other states that only allow oil, the uh, or only allow CBD products. Um, the variety of different interpretations of what what's medical 
are are staggering in their variance, but they all illustrate something. We, we all recognize there's some additional properties in one or another of the facets involved with the cannabis plant. It's amazing the different ways that we can decide to make it legal while slowly unwrapping ourselves from this drug war nonsense we've had. Okay. All right. You know, this this covering of issues uh, associated with this is, uh, I mean, when was the last time you saw an order granting leave that had and was requesting, you know, legal arguments on, I don't know, how many are there, seven issues. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you guys understand the uh, what I'm suggesting in adding drama to, intentionally? These are the gray areas that they want to resolve. But it, it goes and, beyond and the it. single case has the potential to do quite a bit of good or quite a bit of damage, right? Yes, that's it, I guess, man. You want to do final thoughts with 90 seconds left? So we Please, can... let's do it. Hey, uh, don't forget about the Michigan normal golf outing this weekend in Jackson, Michigan. It's on Saturday. Uh, you can find an event page on Facebook, or you can go to um, the Michigan normal website, take a look for it on Google. Uh, it should be great. It's 25 bucks to golf, uh, 18 holes. Uh, get a free hot dog, get the turn. There's going to be all kinds of games. It's a f- fantastic amount of stuff. So take a look at that. Also, uh, on the Compassion Chronicle, several other fundraisers for worthy causes are mentioned in addition to one that Robin talked about tonight. So those are my final thoughts. Uh, Jamie says he has no final thoughts to contribute. Chad? I'm uh, I'm also done. Thank you very much. How about a Birmingham Compassion Club meeting? When are we doing that? <laughs> 